Um, so our next uh, speaker is going to be Eddie Zhang. He's a project director at the Community Youth Center of San Francisco, and he oversees the agency's special projects and school-based outreach program. His mission is to use his, use his experiences to inspire and motivate young people to invest in their education, raise awareness about the detrimental impact that the prison industrial complex has on the Asian and Pacific Islander population, and promote racial harmony among people of color. There's also way more in his bio, so you know he's very important. I'm not going to read it all. I'll let, you, I'll let him talk about it. So please welcome Eddie Zhang. Thank you. So ideally, I would like to have like two hours to really to talk and engage in a dialogue and conversation with all of you. But since I don't have that time, I'll have like 20 minutes or 25 minutes. I want to take advantage of every minute, every, every second of this time. Right? So to start off, I just want to say that uh, it is a privilege and honor for me to be in this space with all of you. Right? The other thing I want to say is that the question I want you to ask yourself throughout this time that you're here in this space is that, how did I get here? Right? And then the other question is, where am I going? How did I get here? And where am I going? Right. So, by means of introduction, I want to read the autobiography poem that I wrote a few years back, and I'll just share it with you. So, to give you a little bit of a context about who I am and what I do, and why am I here. And uh, the autobiography is called Autobiography at 33. So, I'm 33 years old, and breathing is a good year to die to myself, despite being mired in constant ear deafening screams from the cage occupants, triple CMS gang validated, parole violators, lifers, three strikers, drug casualties, human beings. In San Quentin's 150-year-old solitary confinement, I don't want to start things over. At 33, I'm very proud of being who I am. I wrote to a stranger who said that you deserve to boost your youth and not return to society until well into your middle age, after he read an article about me in San Francisco Weekly. Well, I said to him that, a hundred years from now, when we no longer exist on this earth, humankind, the seriousness of my crime will not change unless I cannot pay my debt to my victims because I cannot turn back the hands of time. I will not judge. See, whenever I think about my crime, I feel ashamed. I've lost my youth and more. I've learned that the more I suffer, the stronger I become. I'm blessed with great friends. I talk better than I write because the police can't hear my conversation. The prison official labeled me a trouble troublemaker since I dared to challenge the administration for a civil rights violation. I fought for ethics studies in the prison college program. I've been a slave for 16 years under the 13th Amendment. I know separation and disappointment intimately. I memorized the United Front points of unity. I love my family and friends. My shiro, Yori Kochiyama, and young sister named Monica, who is pretty, wanted to come visit me. Somehow, I have more female friends than male friends. I never made love to a woman. Sometimes I feel like 16, but my body disagrees. Some people call me a square because I don't drink, smoke, or do drugs. I'm a procrastinator, but I get things done. I've never been back to my motherland. I started to learn Spanish. At times, I can be very selfish and vice versa. I've never been to a prom, concert, opera, sporting event, or my parents' house. I don't remember the last time I cried. I sweated for the Native Americans, attended Mass with the Catholics, went to services with the Protestants, and sat and chanted with the Buddhists. My mind is my church. I'm spoiled. In 2000, a young lady I love stopped loving me. It felt worse than losing my freedom. I was denied parole for the ninth time. I assured mom that I'd be home one day after she pleaded with me to answer a question truthfully. Are you ever going to get out of prison? You see, the prison industry complex and this mass is trying to control my mind, but it didn't work. Because they didn't know that I was introduced to Chief Rivera, Yuri Kochiyama, Paulo Ferri, Howard Zinn, Frederick Douglass, Asada Shakur, Bell Hooks, Maurice Comfort, Malcolm X, Gandhi, George Jackson, Mumia, and Buddha, and many others. I had about 100 books in myself as I was internalizing my politics. In 2000, I organized the first poetry slam in San Quentin. I earned my associate of art degree, something that I never thought possible. I self published a zine. I was the poster boy for San Quentin. Sometimes in the 90s, my grandparents died without knowing that I was in prison. At 30, I kissed my dad on the cheek. I told him that I loved him for the first time. I read my first poem. I call myself a poet because it motivates me to write. I also know that poets will set us free. 
1998, I was granted parole, then it was taken away. The governor's political career superseded my life. Sometimes in the 90s, I really learned how to read and write. In 1996, I wrote my first history book, of the history book, A People's History of the United States. My social conscious mind was awakened. In 1992, I passed my GED in Solano prison. I learned how to take care of my body from 89 to 93. In 1987, I turned 18 and went to the pen from the Youth Authority, the youngest prisoners in San Quentin's maximum security prison. I was lucky, because people thought I knew Kung Fu. <laughs> At 16, I bought an innocent family of four and scarred them for life. Money superseded human suffering. I was charged as an adult and sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. No hablo inglés. I wish I could start things over. I was completely lost. At 12, I left communist China and came to capitalist America. No hablo inglés. I was spoiled. In 1976, I went to the demonstration against the Gang of Four. Life was a blur from ages 1 to 6. On May 29, 1969, I inhaled my first breath. <coughs> so that, that's my poem. Uh, so. <clears throat> so how did I get here? I, I came here as an immigrant, as Dennis mentioned earlier, when we talk about what generation I was, I, I'm a 1.5 generation. I came here because my parents, my grandparents thought that it would be better for the children to come over to the United States for a better future, for a better education opportunity, better work, work opportunity, career opportunity. But I wasn't able to assimilate just like any other immigrants who may have been able to have an easy uh, transition from, from, the, from whatever country that they come from. I had a difficult time. You know, when, when, as immigrants, we all have to deal with the language barrier, the cultural differences, and generation gaps. And those things really Held me, held me back uh, in my life. And I ended up you know, spending 19 years of my life in the prison system and also spent two more years in the uh, immigration detention center because of the mandatory detention and deportation laws. And so I, I grew up in prison. So I spent 21 years of my life in prison. And, but during my incarceration, I was able to find myself. I was able to really take responsibility for my actions and you know, really understood the pain and suffering that I've caused to my victims and my family and the community. Um, so I determined that for the rest of my life, my mission is to service the youth and the community and to pay forward. So how does it relate to Asian American studies or ethnic studies? Well, see, when, we, when we're always talking about you know, education, people always say knowledge is power. But we don't really understand that power until we exercise it. Right? So just like the way that Harvey and many of his comrades exercised in 1968 to be able to advocate for ethnic studies, just like the people, the students in 1999 in UC Berkeley who demonstrated out here to preserve Asian American studies and ethnic studies program, they were exercising their power. For me, as an immigrant who would come to the United States not understand the English and have to learn that in the prison system, I was able to accumulate that power because education saved my life inside. And how does it relate to Asian American study was that I was able to read many other people's histories. Even in the college classes they had in there, I was reading African American history, European history, Latino history, um, South African history, you know, everybody else's history except no one's learning about Asian American history and Asian American literature. So that creates a lot of stereotype, a lot of misunderstanding between the different groups. So for me, as someone that who became socially conscious, that who, who was able to really think about the conditions, the people inside the prison, but then also thinking about the condition of people that were struggling and suffering outside you know, the prison, then I, I realized that we need to have Asian American studies and Asian American literatures inside the prison college program so other groups can learn about it, so we can dispel this type of stereotype and myth and, and misunderstanding. Right? So myself and a couple of my fellow students we were able to write a proposal to the, the people in charge with the college program and advocating for Asian American study classes and also uh, liter Asian American literature. However, the administration uh, cut wind of what we were doing because we were engaged in a student body dialogue with the faculty members, with all the different uh, students who were inside 
And when they found out about it, they took all of us one by one into solitary confinement because we signed that proposal. But what they said was that because we were challenging their authority, we were starting kind of starting trouble, creating a lot of you know tension. Therefore, they locked us up in the solitary confinement. So I spent 11 months of my life in solitary confinement. And I have to, I have to borrow a, a line from Charles Dinkins, A Child of Two City. It was the best of time and it was the worst of time. It was the worst of time because as a life-term prisoner, once you put it in solitary, once you put it in solitary confinement, my chances of getting out, getting my freedom, became very slim. But then I, I didn't think about that because when I was signing that proposal, when I was advocating for that with my fellow students, all I knew was that I wanted to advocate for opportunity of education. I wanted to be able to ask other people to learn about our culture and our history because that is important. So I never thought about the possibility that I would get in trouble with the administration. The best of time was that the community got my back. The people from UC Berkeley, UC St. Mary's, UC Davis, all the universities around the area, they all came and created a grassroots movement to be able to support us when we were in solitary confinement. So they were writing on Asian weeks, you know, with all the media outlets, like the ethnic media outlets, you know, they, they were really supporting us. So that's what I felt empowered, even more so, right, that I knew that I did the right thing. So the, the thing for me is, is a privilege for me to be able to engage in that path and also learning about Asian American study was that when I was reading all the books about other people's history, it really empowered me to understand their struggles and their challenges and how much similarity we have as a community, as different groups of people. Right? So when, once I understood that and then I understood my history, then it really opens up my communication with all the, all the people. So for me, a one, one, couple of people that I always talk about in the prison system to really promote racial harmony, to engage especially with the African American, uh, was Riyori Kochiyama and Richard Aoki. Mm. Right? Those are the two people that I really talked about with the African American, even some of the people that who was in the Black Panthers, who was in the diff different liberation groups, that they don't, they don't even know who Yuri Kuchimayama is, how her relations with Malcolm X and with the, the Latinos, with the Cubans, you know, how, how is she putting her life, how her family put her life out there to really be inclusive and fighting against injustice for all, yeah. wherever that is, right? So not exclusive for just the Asian, right? So that, they taught me that it is important to understand uh, other people's history, but what is more important is to understand our history and our origin, who, who, where we come from. And I appreciate that. Right? Be proud of who you are. Right? That's, that's what's important. So although I spent 11 months in solitary confinement, but then I, I received a lifetime of education during that 11 months because of the community support that I received. Right? Before, as always, you hear other people from whenever injustice happened, the African Americans stand up and other groups will stand up. But a lot of Asian Americans, they're quiet. Right? Because it's not our business. You know? But we're not supposed to be rebel rousers. We're not supposed to be doing that, right? Because we need to fit into that modern minority myth. Right? So, but then it's, it's changed. Right? So therefore, it's very important for us to understand that it's okay if you want to be a doctor, be an engineer, be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But make sure that that's really what you want to do. Right? Because there are a lot of lawyers out there who are doing public interest laws that are helping people. The immigration lawyers, we need those people. We need all of that. We need engineers. Right? But however, if you're doing that because your parents are asking you to do it, or they tell you to do it and you really don't like it, then maybe you need to really think about that. Right? So majoring in Asian American studies or ethnic studies is an opportunity for you to open your world, to enhance your other majors, your other careers. Right? So that, that is a fact. Because you can't just stay in, in this bubble and just think about, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it, I'm going to make my family proud, but then you're isolating, isolating yourself, isolating your community and what, who, who you're connecting with. Right? 